Hello, I'm here with Dr. Angela Williamson, and I'm very honored because she is the director and producer of the documentary film, My Life with Rosie. And that is about the life uh, and legacy of Rosa Parks. And Angela is a cousin of Rosa Parks, and so we're very glad to have her with us. How are you? Great, how are you? I'm doing great too. Um, what would you say uh, is your, your primary uh, vocation in life? I am first, just like you, I am first an educator. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of years before I transitioned into education in working in television. And right before I transitioned over, I was working at Fox 11 oh, wow. and yes, doing all the promotions for them and Fox Sports. But in my heart, I was always wanted to be an educator. But before I did that, I wanted to come in with that experience. So when I made that transition, I knew that I was moving into a field that I'd always desired. So I've always mm. been an educator at heart, even when I wasn't working in education. So how did you decide to use the medium of uh, filmmaking and documentary films in particular? Well, especially with this project, it really came together. After I graduated with my doctorate, I knew I wanted to do research and, but I didn't know what kind of research I wanted to do. And what happened was it, it really was my professional life and my personal life at the same time just intersected. And so personally, we lost what we considered the patriarch of our family mm -hmm. at the time, which was my father-in-law. And then professionally, I was trying to build what we call a CV mm -hmm. and with research. And so when I decided that um, because I wasn't affiliated with any college or university, so I could choose my own research, I decided to choose my family because it fit with my doctorate, which was under the School of Public Service Leadership. But then also, when I look at my life personally, I wanted to start to capture our oral histories. Mm -hmm. So what was the best way to capture oral her histories was, oh yeah, I used to work in video. And so it just happened like that. It was the original thought. And then once it started, it just spiraled out mm. of control. Mm. But in a good way. Yes. <laughs> and it's really nice. I mean, at, at Concordia here, uh, where I teach as a professor, one of the things we emphasize is the ways in which our vocations kind of overlap with our personal lives, our spiritual lives, and our professions. And, uh, and so it fits very nicely with the fact that you're teaching in communications and uh, that's really, I think, one of the, the best ways in which in more recent times people have been able to really get educated. I mean, if you look at the streaming options and, and uh, this, your film is available yes. via streaming. And because of this, I, I think a lot of young people are much better educated they were about things that we take for granted, but they didn't really read it or it wasn't in the book, but they, they get kind of tied into the documentary as a medium. That's fantastic. But when you're trying to communicate something, of course, what would you say is the core message of Rosa Parks and her, her public life? I'm sure she had all sorts of wonderful other things to say about parenting or whatever, but in public life. What I tried to focus on in this documentary was to show a Rosa Parks that is beyond what our history books have told us. And so what I wanted to do is show Rosa Parks from the uh, point of view of her family mm. and, and what she taught us. And it wasn't as if she taught directly to my generation of the family, but because she taught to the generation before and they taught down. So the importance of her legacy going from generation to generation. And so what I wanted to do with this documentary was to focus on her beyond the bus boycott. Mm. Because what I realized was she is what we call, and when we're writing in the business, a three-dimensional character. Mm. There's more to her than what we saw in our history books. And so in a way, that's what I wanted to do, but I wanted to do it through the eyes of family mm. so they could see this person who did this remarkable thing, but see a person that's human, just like you or, or me, who face adversity. 
but mm. she, at that point, she faced adversity and she made a stand. And a lot of that had to do because of her faith mm. and because of the family that stood behind her. Mm. So, I mean, when I was growing up, when I would read in my you know, high school history book, the, the picture was, was pretty one dimensional, I think. And mm -hmm. it kind of gave me this impression that this was entirely accidental. And then, of course, there are others who would say, uh, no, there was a way in which this was something that was going to come up in her life. To what extent was the Montgomery bus incident um, somehow part of her activism, if at all? And I'm so glad you talk about this because it actually, I actually talk about how she came to that point. Mm. And how I'm able to do that is by interviewing her biographer. Mm. Dr. Jean Theo Harris. But one of the things that people don't realize when we're reading our book, because of course when we're reading it, it's not a very long story because it's part of a bigger story. Right. And we understand that um, what my cousin did was part of the bigger story of a movement that brought across uh, people of different gender, races, et cetera. But what they don't realize is that a lot of times when we look at the books, it says that she, she pretty much, she was tired. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us think, oh, well, she's physically tired. She's at the end of her workday. But what they don't realize is that what we mean by tired is because up until that point, she had had years of activism mm -hmm. that, had in, that had really motivated her, including a few arrests before hers, mm -hmm. that when we say tired, it's not because it was physical, it's because she was emotionally tired of what was mm -hmm. happening to a group of people. Mm -hmm. So when, we, when you look at this documentary, that was one of my goals as bringing her from that one dimension to the three dimension is to mm -hmm. say, wow, there was more to this and there was more to this lady than what we know about. I mean, because without those many years of activism before, which came from her husband, he mm. got her involved. Without those years of activism before, which set the groundwork, I wonder if there ever would have been a December 1st, mm. 1955. Mm. And so that's what I touch a little bit upon and then much in pretty much most of her adult life after because mm. how does she continue it when she's done? In our books, the boycott ends and all is well. And that's yeah. But it's not, and we and we know that because we live in the society. We've done further history. But what I wanted to do is bring it to other people to see there was more after that, and that was really what shaped the woman she is, mm. what we know as cousin Rosie in our family. Mm. Civil courage is something that comes at a price very often. We we think. I, I know, uh, I've talked to many students, they, they go back and they think about the heroes of American life, the, the folks that they want to emulate, mm -hmm. and they think, well, um, that's great. Maybe you get rich and famous out of this. I mean, it's great. A lot of young people want to be in, in, in the, the book. And I am assuming that Rosa Parks did not get rich and famous for this. What were the repercussions of this act, especially at the time in Montgomery, Alabama? The way that my family comes into play, it's not just because she grew up um, with my husband's grandfather. So I married into the family. So it's not because she grew up with, the gran with my husband's grandfather, but really what comes into play here is that my husband's grandfather, which she writes in her book, Rosa Parks, My Story, is he's one of the main reasons why she ends up in Detroit. Mm. And the reason that she end up, ends up in Detroit is because both her and her husband lose their jobs mm. and they do not have a livelihood and they are fully supporting Rosa's aunt, or Rosa's mother, who turns out to be um, our aunt. And so with that, they are really, they really struggle financially, but it doesn't stop her from supporting what she believes is, is a wrong in society. And when she gets to Detroit, and basically it's because my grandfather helps her get to Detroit financially, but when she gets to Detroit, they're still out of work. Mm -hmm. And what people don't realize is that there is a great cost 
to when we know that something is is wrong and we stand up for right sometimes there's a great cost and with her it was she it would take her almost 20 plus years before she would get full-time work mm. as a secretary to mm. the congressman john conyers it would it would take her going through a lot of physical ailments which mm. is why everybody always sees her they see her when she's older and they see her mm -hmm. a little bit frail was well, right. because she was fighting things in her body mm -hmm. because of what she was going through. But what was really great about Cousin Rosie and one of the things is that people don't realize is with my husband, this is all a part of what he was. But with me coming into the family, reading about her in a book, is that even though she went through all of these hardships, when I met her, just the grace that she had mm. because she accepted that this was her life and this was her calling. Her calling was to make sure that people did not have injustice. Mm. And so what people don't realize is they think, oh, she, was, she had a lot of money, she had these great book deals. No, she struggled mm. financially, she struggled um, physically and I mean where things we take for granted you know owning a home mm -hmm. she never owned a home Wow! but you know what it was worth it to her because she stood on she stood on what she believed until she took her last breath mm. so as she's experiencing a, a different kind slightly more perhaps underneath the surface kind of injustice in the context of Detroit mm -hmm. Was any of her life going to continue in that uh, kind of advocacy and activism? Uh, to what extent was she engaged in that sort of thing after uh, she moved to Detroit? Okay, so what's really interesting, and I found this out, so this is why I'm an educator first, because we start with our research. Right. So even though I had the oral histories, I wanted to do research because what I focused on was a lot of her activism, which was almost four decades, that's mm -hmm. a lot, in, in the city of Detroit. And really what I found out was, because of what was happening in the South, there's a huge migration from the South to the North. And right. a lot of people know that, because the North did not have what we called segregation, but they had segregation in a way where they would zone mm -hmm. different ways. It was housing and economic. And exactly. So therefore subtle. So all of a sudden, she, after she has to move from Alabama to Detroit because they don't have anything, they don't have anything to help them financially, they don't have jobs. Um, she's also getting death threats. I mean, mm -hmm. they don't, so that's where the health comes into play. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking they leave and you're thinking, oh, this is like the, that show, remember the Beverly Hillbillies, where they yeah. leave and everything's <laughs> wonderful. But they get to Detroit and she looks around and this is what I love her biographer says. She looks around, she's like, this is not much different from what I left from. Mm. Well, I guess my job isn't done. Mm. And that's when she realized that she had to continue to fight because, because it didn't matter to her that there wasn't the legal segregation. It was the, the unseen segregation mm. where she knew she needed to continue the fight. And so basically one of the quotes that um, is in The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks is that um, Cousin Rosie says, the struggle is not over. Mm -hmm. And so basically I would think that that was her, her moment that she realized that even though she left it, her struggle was not over. And that would continue the, for her until the end of her life over 40 years. Hearts might not have changed. Or there might be ways, as we've seen, that there are, there are other subtle factors that are going on. What would you say to students if they want to be inspired by and in, in the best sense emulate Rosa Parks? What would, what would you encourage students to do to? I learned this a lot because when I started doing this documentary, I was at, it was at a time of my life where I was struggling um, personally because of the loss of my father-in-law and um, professionally because I wasn't where I wanted to be. And by learning more facts and details about Cousin Rosie, I realize, and this is something that anybody can do, I realize with any adversity that comes in our life, we have to make a choice of how we're going to deal with that adversity. Mm. Are we going to wallow in it? 
or are we going to find a way that we can turn that adversity into something positive? And I think Cousin Rosie did that. She hit adversity in every detail. I mean, every, every part of her life is what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And when she hit adversity, she never stopped. She could have stopped because she could have said, okay, I did this one act, I suffered, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm done, you know? Right. But she didn't. And so I think what we learned from her story is that through adversity, that can show us what we can really do. Mm -hmm. And without that, then I don't think we can make our differences in the world because mm -hmm. it, it's those challenges and how we face those challenges that helps. Oh, that's so great. Thank you so much for this film, for sitting down with me, and for what you do uh, to, to bring some of these ideas to students. Thank you. It's my pleasure.